Hey, welcome back to another I Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Well, tonight's topic is not the most appetizing. So if you are eating something, I suggest you maybe put it down, but it is certainly interesting and actually very important to the brain health community. We are talking about fecal matter transplant. That's right. This is a microbiota transplant, also called a stool transplant, also called a human probiotic infusion, also called bacteriotherapy. This is based on the premise that we need a balance of helpful and unhelpful bacteria in the gut. Specifically, we need good or beneficial bacteria to do the job of absorbing micronutrients, to digest our food efficiently, ideally through a process of fermentation, and reduce gut inflammation. Some medical conditions and antibiotic use can destroy the good bacteria. We also see that it's very difficult to keep this optimal balance in a processed food diet. This is concerning because 74% of the U.S. food chain is considered to be ultra processed food that is not even recognized as food by the human immune system and the gut. That's pretty scary. The problem with the processed diet is the food doesn't stick around long enough to ferment and break down, which gives us the micronutrients, which turn into compounds like short chain fatty acids that really, really, really help all aspects of health, including brain health. So a fecal matter transplant is an evidence-based way to reintroduce the good or helpful bacteria and you're gonna learn that there are two FDA approved applications for this that have nothing to do with brain health, but there's a lot of research that is suggesting it, it's probably going to be a best practice approach in the very near future. So the, the mechanism of action, how we consider this works, is through the concept of bacterial interference. So what this means is we wanna put so much good or helpful bacteria into the lining of the gut that we displace the unhelpful or the pathogenic organism. So this is through the process of competitive niche exclusion. So all throughout the gut wall, we have kind of like these little lock and key fits for bacteria latching onto the lining of the gut wall. Harmful bacteria is a lot more assertive. It is very comfortable setting up shop and it can uh, create its own population of identical unhelpful bacteria very, very quickly. So when you have an aggressive, not helpful bacteria, it actually is very uh, quick to grow and we need to infiltrate it with really uh, overwhelming it with a lot of the helpful bacteria. So we just have a balance. The goal is not to have no bad bacteria in the gut. That's not realistic, but what we do want to have is a balance and ideally a little bit more of the helpful. So gut and brain, if you're not aware, is probably the latest in the uh, evidence-based neuroscientific approach to brain health. This is through the connection connections that exist that are indirect and direct connecting brain to gut. So the primary communication channel there is the vagus nerve. This is a bi-directional system that is hardwired communication between the gut and the brain. What's really interesting is 80% of the information goes this way. So it actually seems that the gut has much more influence on the brain than the, the alternative. So what happens in the gut really dictates a lot of our what we call immune response and immuno communications to the brain. So this is really modulated through inflammation. So we know that there are brain cells that exist outside the brain and they actually line the entire gut, which is really just considered a tube from where food comes in to where food goes out. And we, we have brain cells all throughout that. So when there is any type of inflammation in the gut, which happens when the unhelpful bacteria is predominating, then we have inflammatory alarms or signals that are going up to the brain that are saying there's something wrong here. Then the immune system starts to send out inflammatory cells to counteract the inflammation. So we can, we actually think this is the basis for the rise in autoimmune conditions that we see, but also just for some people kind of a, a restless, anxious feeling that there's something wrong, but they can't quite put their finger on it. And this parlays itself into uh, pretty significant depression or anxiety for a lot of people. So gut health, reducing inflammation, these are kind of the newest 
you know, evidence-based way of really trying to infiltrate brain health. So getting back to this idea of an FMT, fecal matter transplant, um, this is actually not a new idea. This has been used all the way back into the fourth century in China with something that they used to call yellow soup or golden syrup, which was uh, either using fresh or dried and fermented stool to treat abdominal disease. So fast forward to 2023, and we actually have two FDA approvals for doing fecal matter transplants. One is through the process that would be like a colonoscopy, and the other one is actually um, drying it and taking it in capsule form. Remember, I said put down your food. So in the colonoscopy way, this is much more common. You basically do the prep like you would a colonoscopy to completely clean out your, your gut. Um, and then a gastroenterologist basically uses like a scope for a colonoscopy that goes the entire length of the colon. And as they're withdrawing it, they have a solution of donor feces um, that is then going to line the colon with presumably more helpful bacteria. So less commonly, you can also get a um, nose cannula that can put it in directly this way. Um, but there are higher risks of things like aspiration pneumonia. And like I said, you can also get a capsule where it can be swallowed. The transplant um, is donor stool diluted with 2.5 to five times salt water, sterile water, or 4% milk, and it is meant to be 100% liquid. Now, who are the people who are making these donations? That's a really good question. So it really depends on your doctor. You can actually go through a transplant bank or you can have someone you know. So a suitable donor for a fecal matter transplant would be a healthy adult who has not had any antibiotics for six months, is not immunocompromised, is not at risk for an infectious disease, and does not have any chronic gastrointestinal issues like inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel, anything like that. There are no laboratory standards that have been agreed upon. So this is where things get a little bit tricky, especially if you get enthusiastic about this topic and start Googling it, especially for brain health conditions, because I know many of you are desperate for treatment and support. The concern would be that when it's not regulated, we have many standards, standardizations that are not agreed upon. So there are a few things that we do know. We are trying to uh, go for one to three ounces of fecal matter for an effective treatment. And we ideally like to have a fresh sample within six to eight hours. So that way the healthy bacteria is at their most viable. So it has been, like I said before, approved since 2023, but this is only in infectious diarrhea called C. diff. It is incredibly effective, about 90% effective in people who have this recurrent infectious diarrhea called C. diff. So you have to have a history of antibiotics not working, or it has to be recurrent after you use antibiotics. People recover with one fecal matter transplant more effectively than they do with powerful antibiotics like vancomycin. It is more cost effective um, and it reduces the incidence of antibiotic resistance in the person and also in society. In Crohn's disease, we think it can reach about a 60% remission and in ulcerative colitis, it's about 22%. We've also been starting to see it be used in clinical research with people with irritable bowel syndrome which is really re remains an under understood, underappreciated condition, which is really a catch-all for a wide range of digestive issues. But there was a study with 13 people who got an FMT and their symptoms resolved in about 70%. So I think there's some hope there as well. Um, the two FDA approved drugs are called Ribata. So this one was the first. This is actually using the colonoscopy or the in the nose route. Uh, and then we have Voust, which just came out in April, 2023. And that is the first fecal matter microbiota product that you can take in a capsule. Um, so if you have C. diff, this is really good news, but where things actually got interesting for our purposes is when scientists were noticing in human models and in animal models, when they were doing these FMTs, that they were also seeing changes in behavior. So what they started to do was use a mouse model for 
uh, giving someone, giving a, a mouse an FMT. And what they tried to do is they started to try to replicate behavior from the donor mouse. And what they found is just by doing an FMT, nothing else, not changing the food, the environment, the cognitive stimulation, the socialization, nothing, that they were able to increase things like obesity, gregariousness, anxiety, but also things like depression, anorexia, not being interested in food, and even schizophrenia-like conditions. So this started to make smart scientists think, wow, maybe there's a lot going on with this gut-brain health connection that we don't understand, but could it also be a way to change behavior-based disorders. So to date, I would say that this is in the promising stage. We have 21 studies to date that show either improvement or, uh, or transmission. What's interesting is you can reduce symptoms, but you can also cause symptoms. So basically the, the insight was that they could manipulate clinical disorders by just changing the helpful or unhelpful bacteria that were in the gut. So they have shown that they've been able to temporarily reduce the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor disorder, prevent multiple sclerosis progression, reduce seizures, and reduce the size and swelling associated with a stroke. Now, we also have case studies, which is a lot less scientifically robust, but still important. So we have shown that people who have treatment-resistant bipolar disorder have been helped by FMTs, uh, improved autism symptoms for two years following one FMT, and decreased Tourette's syndrome. Pretty, pretty darn interesting. The limitations, though, of course, is that we still haven't defined what is a healthy donor? What is a healthy microbiota? What I have learned from researching this is that there are many, many, many different types of gut bacteria and they react and um, live differently within different people at different times of their lives, with different conditions, within the context of what else is going on, uh, within a life history of antibiotic use, antibiotics that are found in foods. There's so many, so many, so many variables that it's actually been really, really hard to pin down what would be the optimal healthy content of the fecal matter to be transplanted. We also have safety and exploitation concerns at this point. So we have seen deaths from bacterial infections in people who have gone out into the world to try to get the benefits of FMT before it actually gets regulated. So this is something that I took a deep dive into a few months ago when I was designing my gut brain health access webinar. This is two and a half hours of content. Uh, it is available on our website. You'll see that in the description at the bottom um, of the YouTube page here. Um, it is $37 and a portion of your fee goes to the Center for Human Microbiome Studies at Stanford University. I was very impressed by what they're doing. So you get the video replay, copy of my PowerPoint slides, uh, bonus material all directly sent to your inbox. And my job in this webinar was to provide a much deeper dive into this gut brain health connection, focusing on the microbiota and how a disturbed intestinal microbiota can be related to neurological conditions. Talked a lot about what shapes the microbiota, which is absolutely fascinating from who we lived with as children to what we eat today. Talked a lot about the core characteristic that drives many of Western diseases, inflammation, and how that sets up in the gut and what really is a gut-friendly diet. Also talk a lot about the current thinking on prebiotics and probiotics and why I think food choices are much better ideally than taking supplements for these things. And then I also go into these transplants in a little bit more detail, focusing on essential tremor. So I would love for you to check that out if you're so inclined, but I would love to know for right now, what do you think about this topic? Are you somebody that if it was recommended to you, would you get a fecal matter transplant? Would you do it? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this longer length brain health lecture, I would really appreciate you liking the video and subscribing so you can always be notified whenever a new one comes out. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.